Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we've got some board members here. Joe, when you get a second, can you move the camera just over to the right? Because you're getting, we're getting most everybody over here on the, on, the, on my right. And there's not everybody over there. Is that, so. is that better? Or? Yeah, go a little farther. Yeah, that'll give you an idea of who's here. We got a few board members, uh, Sam Chamberlain, Stacey Grayo, and Brian Lachos. We do have board meeting at six o'clock, uh, where on WebEx you can also join for a public uh, forum or a public comment for our reopening plan. Uh, what my plan was, was to five o'clock get started with a presentation uh, to show uh, where we're at with a reopening plan, give a background for that. Um, on WebEx, I'll just give you a quick tour. Uh, you should see at the bottom, there's some bubbles at the bottom. If you move your mouse to the bottom of the screen, um, you can mute your microphone, unmute your microphone. Uh, right now, we're, we're trying to mute microphones because it does get a little distracted with extra noise. So if you need to speak, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Um, there is a chat function at the bottom. So you can click that, um, that bubble. It looks like a little call out button. And you can send in a question that way as well as I'm going over this. But the plan right now is to go over um, our reopening plan as it stands for Beaver River. And uh, I've got some folks, I've got some principals on as well. If the questions come up, we can always turn um, and, and go that direction. Uh, and then also I have Ashley Waite joining us from Public Health. Uh, so she'll jump in in a little bit and uh, go over a couple of things. Uh, we've been working with Public Health on, on a reopening plan as well. So uh, I'm going to jump right into the presentation. Presentation, I will probably go fairly quickly just because we're a little behind schedule. But um, what we'll do is hit the presentation, and then if you have questions, feel free to jump in from there. So that's the YouTube connection that we don't care about. Okay. And there we go. So you should be able to see right now a presentation that's popping up. Um, and uh, it's just easier to go through these. We'll post these slides as well as this video so you'll hear the reopening information. Again, if you have a question, feel free to unmute your mic and, and join in. Um, a plan, what we want to go over is uh, really what our focus of for the reopening discussions that we had uh, here at Beaver River, um, the timeline of what we've done and what our next steps are uh, and what the process was to get there, different considerations that have come out um, and you can see transportation, we'll have um, we'll jump in with some public health information, and we'll talk about our schedule and um, some supports that we have in place. So uh, this has been a very challenging time for sure, I think for all of us in lots of ways. Uh, in school in particular, when we closed in March, we, we had a challenge of um, how to switch from live learning uh, in person to all remote learning. So um, we, we we tried a few things, we learned a few things, uh, but we definitely learned some major pieces that helped us make some choices based upon what was given to us for our decisions. Um, clearly, safety is a top priority uh, for our students. You can't really do anything if you don't have people feeling safe when they're at school or wherever they are. So um, the New York State Department of Education and Health have given us guidelines that we must follow. Um, and those are the guidelines we're taking a look at. Our initial plan was to make sure we were checking the boxes for all the mandatory uh, information uh, that needed to be done for those uh, guidelines. Uh, so that's where you'll see some of the decisions that have taken place. Uh, we also know from our experience in the spring that students learn best when they're here in school, in person, and that is especially important at the early grades. So um, we made some decisions that had some alternate schedules for some younger grades uh, for that. And we also know that we needed to be flexible um, with this plan. And when we talk about this plan, uh, well, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, we tried to get as much input as we could in a short amount of time. Um, we did a parent survey uh, earlier in July, as soon as we got the Department of Health information out, that was in July 13th is when that came out. We pushed out what we thought would be good questions to help us make some decisions. We essentially have about 600 families in our district. We had 590 responses. So um, I'm assuming some of those are pe multiple people from the same family. But really, when you look at that, that's a tremendous response. Uh, it's more than we get to vote, actually. So um, this, that was a good response. 
Um, we took input from the Board of Education, classroom teachers, our support staff, um, healthcare staff from both Carthage Area Hospital and Laubel Hospital. Uh, we have our management team, um, uh, our administrative team, and then Lewis County. We talked, we, um, you can see Ashley's with us today, uh, but also the county manager involved, was involved with our conversations to see what our options were to be able to meet the guidelines that were in place. Uh, real quickly, the timeline, uh, really the, the heavy work started after June 13th when the guidelines were started to be released. We, re we received the Department of Health first, and then the Board of Regents released some information. And as that week went on, we met with our task force to determine uh, what was in front of us for the Department of Health, what those guidelines were, how they would fit into our school as it stands now. Um, this has been a, a heavy lift for many, many people, and still many to come. And what I mean by that is, yes, we had to submit a plan to the state on the 31st of July. When we say submit that to the state, that goes to the Department of Education and the Department of Health. Um, that plan is linked on our website. We'll be posting that uh, tomorrow. I wanted to be able to have a little bit of a conversation before it all goes up so there's some understanding that people can refer to when they take a look at it. Um, but again, that's a, that's a document that is, uh, it's, it's flexible, meaning that we are able to edit that. It is a draft version of the plan. So that means we submit it to the state saying, we know that we're going to check the boxes that you've given to us. But in the meantime, we're going to continue to work on making sure that what we have in front of us um, is what's best for our school district. So um, obviously we had to make some decisions, and um, those decisions which appear tonight at this point. But there are specifics in the plan that uh, we will be working out as we get more to the function of school and how that operates. So things that we have to consider, and these really are coming from the Department of Health and Department of Education guidelines. So these, some of these are actually uh, non-negotiable in terms of what we're told we must do for our students when they come. And in some cases, these, uh, these uh, criteria are uh, a little ambig ambiguous, so we've been trying to get some things clarified to make sure we meet what, what there is. So right now, one of the major guidelines that's affecting the school and decisions that we're making is the, um, the guideline for the students need to, and actually every individual in the building, needs to maintain social distancing, which means that's six feet of space. Um, and if they are not able to keep that six feet of space, they must wear masks. So um, those, those are probably the two pieces that were um, heavy list that really adjusted what we could do for numbers of people in the building at a time because of the amount of space that we have. Uh, one good thing about the mask situation is that masks may be removed during instructional time. So you can see in this room, we've got uh, five people. Uh, and we're six feet apart. This would be like in a classroom. Um, when we walked in, we had our masks. When we sat down, we were sitting six feet apart during our instructional time, and we were able to take off masks at that particular point. Um, during meal times, and also we are uh, supposed to give mask breaks as well. Um, the other, another piece, with the discussion in the guidelines, was the limited movement um, is important. Uh, because the, uh, I got somebody wanting to annotate. I'm going to hit approve because I'm not sure what that means, but we'll see what happens. Um, limited movement is important to groups of students. So they talk about cohorts, meaning um, trying to keep groups of students together. Um, and I'm wondering if someone clicked that by accident, maybe to annotate. Um, but again, if you need to make a comment, if you're looking to make a comment, at the bottom, you should see a bubble. You can uh, type in, when you click on that bubble at the bottom, uh, you'll be able to type in your, um, your comment. More considerations related to um, the guidelines and information that we understood as time went on. Um, we know that cohorting is more difficult as you get older. If you think about a group of students that stay together in the elementary, students typically stay together throughout the day. So third grade, grade class is a group of the cohort that would stay together. The issue with third grade class would be the size of the room and the number of students we can have to keep them six feet apart. Um, so the cohorting at the elementary ages are much easier than when you think about a, say, a 10th grade class where you've got an English class that might have students, the English 10 class, that might have students, some that take algebra, some that take geometry, some that might be advanced, 
uh, to another math. Um, and so when that class is over, they go to another place. So keeping them cohorted is much more difficult at the, um, uh, at the older level. Um, when we did our survey, we asked about child care. We understand, we know that child care is a huge issue for um, students if they're not at school. Um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a function that school districts uh, uh, provide for families. Um, and if we can't have our students in school all day, that means that becomes a burden of child care on families. So we are working to, at ways that we can be the conduit to connect child care providers uh, with families. When we did our survey, it was clear that if families could stay together, that would make life a whole lot easier for families. Uh, there might be an older child at home, um, or you're only trying to find child care for a certain number of days a week, that might be easier. So um, that's one reason why we looked at looking, putting them into two, uh, two different groups. Um, so you'll see that schedule in a little bit, and you read about that um, in the letter. Um, one unique thing about us, uh, space uh, is, has become a little bit easier to get because we were able to move some classes around. Um, so there is some space to use, but some of that space will have to be used for things like isolating students if they get sick or um, classrooms and those kind of things. So we do have some, we are able to create some space within the school, but we had some major limitations in terms of um, the guidelines. And in particular, one is the number of staff we have. Uh, our staff are assigned uh, to specific roles. They have certain certifications. And while the Regents allowed some flexibility for those certifications, they are still, um, we still only have some limitations around that. Um, and the other piece is uh, understanding that um, we have staff that are assigned to particular students or groups of students that have particular needs. And that's a big piece to make sure students stay on track. We learned that through um, the spring that especially with um, students with disabilities, special ed education students uh, really need the contact time uh, to remain successful and actually get what is required based upon their IEP. So um, we know that we need to have staff that are able to deliver that as well. Um, so let's talk about transportation just for a second. Uh, as we work through the guidelines, there were some very confusing guidelines around transportation when we talk about six feet apart and wearing masks or wearing masks um, was in the guidance. I think we've landed in a region uh, to a very common place that in transportation, we're able to have students who are, don't live together. Because if you live together, then they can be cohorted together on the bus. Um, where if you take every seat, and every row and put two students in each row, one at the window, one at the aisle, and then the next row you flip-flop that so the, that the other side is at the aisle, the other side is at the window, you're able to keep nearly six feet apart, plus there's a barrier between most students because those seats are high, and wearing a mask, that should reach the, what's required for the Department of Health at this point. Um, the issue with that is that um, students need to wear their mask the entire time. Um, temperature screening, I'm going to talk, talk touch, that, touch with that a little bit, um, give them more details with that, but that is something that will be done with transportation. Um, and then actually, uh, one of the biggest issues is when we did our survey, we found that about 50% of the families said that they could actually transport their students. Um, if we take 50% of our, of our students and split them in half, because as you know on the schedule, we have uh, a green and an orange schedule, so that's split in half. At that point, we still don't have down to 22 students on the bus. So what we need to do is figure out next is to figure out the number of students that can be transported to school to see if we can get down to the 22 students on the bus. So we are still not to the point where transportation can work with the amount of runs that we have. What we may have to do is actually shift our runs um, so we will be asking from our uh, families input on transportation. Um, that will probably be done through a survey like we did with the other survey. Um, that will give us um, specific information by family. Okay, now health checks. This was something that was a bit of a surprise that came out when the, when the guidelines came out for school districts. Um, and we have been doing health text checks for individuals who come into our building. Uh, they fill a questionnaire and they, they sign that. Um, one of the requirements is that every student, every individual that enters the school building must have a temperature check. 
um, that's prior to entering the building or the educational space. Uh, so that's why you saw in transportation, temperature checks, checks will be performed on the buses. Uh, we're hoping to at least start off with uh, monitors on the bus to be able to support that, uh, which means if a student has a temperature of 100.0 degrees, is in the guidance, um, or higher, um, they will be, they will need to remain home. Um, so we've got to work through the process on what that looks like. Um, if a student has a temperature below 100, um, uh, they they can come to school. Uh, if they have a temperature from 99 to 100, we'll probably do a double check when they come to school. So if we have students that come to school that don't ride the bus, um, they we have we're working on a check-in system for temperature checks. Uh, most likely through our elementary gym, we'll basically have a queue system set up uh, where we'd be able to check temperatures, um, and you'll get a pass for the day. Just like when you go to the hospital right now, you. You get your temperature check and you get a wristband. That'll probably be the process that we have. We're in, we're in the process of researching um, the best place to get what we need to make that work. Uh, we do have the temperature, uh, uh, forehead temperature checking material right now. So that's in place. Um, all employees are required to complete a questionnaire every day as well as a temperature check. Okay, so all adults in the building uh, are required. But students are going to be asked a questionnaire periodically. So um, those are those are guidelines that are in the Department of Health um, guidelines. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ashley in just a second. Uh, we've had some work with public health, um, and and some of our decisions uh, revolve around what social distancing means, um, what symptomatic versus positive individuals, and they, they actually worked with us on creating a, a nice chart and flow chart for when students uh, feel sick. How does that work? And then there's another part that's contact tracing that is really handled outside of school, but through the Department of Health, and we want to be able to work with, with uh, Department of Health for that. So, um, Ashley, I know we talked about this would be your slide. I'm hoping we still have you connected. Are you still there? Yep, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, great. So first, I want to thank Mr. Green for inviting me to speak to you all tonight. Um, it's very important that public health and schools work together as we move toward um, a safe and effective way to educate our children. So our job at public health is really to reduce um, the risk of transmission of coronavirus. We certainly can't eliminate all risk but we can institute measures such as social distancing, mask wearing and hand washing um, to, to decrease that risk dramatically. So the first thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is the importance of social distancing. So we know the most common way that this virus is transmitted is through close contact, less than six feet with somebody for an extended period of time. And you'll see as uh, I work through the diagram below that extended period of time um, through research has been determined to be more than 10 minutes. Um, so in order to prevent the spread, we must ensure that people maintain that six feet of distance. Um, and also you'll see what happens when individuals do not as I, as I work down through that diagram. So, as Mr. Green said, uh, the screening is very important. Uh, we do not want any potentially infected child or staff member um, exposing other students. So, any symptomatic student or staff member will go through the following process that you can see here on the slide. So, anyone that is symptomatic and the, the symptoms of coronavirus really grew uh, throughout this pandemic. It, it started out with fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, the CDC now defines uh, fatigue, so being tired, muscle or body aches, headache, a new loss of taste or smell, a sore throat, uh, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea as a symptom of coronavirus. So individuals with these symptoms should be isolated and sent home immediately because we cannot rule out the fact that um, it could be coronavirus. 
Now, it certainly could be a multitude of other things, but this is not something that we want to risk. So these individuals um, should seek medical attention. And in the guidance from the New York State Department of Health, um, a note from the provider or a negative COVID-19 test or 14 days from the onset of symptoms um, should occur before that student or staff member is allowed to return to school. On the other hand, if the student were to, to get the COVID-19 test and were to test positive student or staff member, um, the local health department is notified immediately when that test result comes back. It comes to us. So we just contact the student or parents um, staff to perform our case investigation. So within the case investigation is what we call contact tracing. So we start the contact tracing 48 hours after the symptoms started or before the positive test if the individual did not have any symptoms. So all persons that were within six feet for more than 10 minutes during that time frame would be quarantined for 15 days because they'd be considered at risk for having contracted the, um, the virus. So part of the quarantine is public health checking in with them every day um, and checking for symptoms and also testing these individuals um, to show that the virus has not spread. So we will work in collaboration with the school um, for the contact tracing. Our investigations um, are very in depth and we utilize um, multiple sources for information so that we can make sure we have every possible contact and um, that they truly are a contact before we quarantine them. So the positive student or staff will be isolated for a minimum of 10 days from the start of their symptoms, uh, or if they're asymptomatic or don't have any symptoms, it's 10 days from the date of their positive test. Um, and they can return to school after that 10 days as long as their symptoms are progressively improving and they have three days being fever free. Um, and on the other side there, you can see that the contacts to the positive case can return to school after 14 days of being quarantined um, and um, making sure that they have not tested positive for COVID. And that's all I have. Thank you. That's, uh, this chart has really clarified um, kind of the steps for this. Uh, we've included this in our plan and, and we'll put this on our website as well. It's been, it's been very helpful to get to that point. Um, thank you, Ashley. Um, what I might do just because of time, if anyone has any public health questions, you can unmute your mic. Um, if you don't mind hanging on, Ashley, I'm going to keep going, but if somebody wants to, they can just interrupt me and ask questions at that point. So how does that sound? Does that work? So um, we had a lots of discussion around what happens when the students get sick, and I guess this this flow chart really helps with that piece. It also helps us define why it's important for we now we it kind of makes sense about the distancing piece, and you know if students are walking between classrooms, why they can wear masks because they're not really exposed. They can walk between class. They can. Um, and if they wear a mask, they fall under the guidelines. They're only going to see each other just for a minute or less than a second, even as they pass each other. So that would not be a contact trace. So, um, but, but keeping the numbers down allows us to contact trace as well. So, um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide, I believe. Yes. Okay. So this gets us into the schedule. And there was a, this, this was probably, I would say, maybe the 15th iteration of what we came up with with the schedule. 
uh, because we, we went back and forth with many particular ideas. Uh, we used our survey to get information from families and um, we really honed in once we were, uh, once we pulled staff in to see what the needs were, those kind of things. So, um, so one of the hardest decisions we had was the first item you see on here, which is pre-K is not going to be held for the beginning of the school year. I'll get into a little bit more of an explanation about that in a minute, about um, why, where that decision came from. Um, kindergarten through first grade. Uh, again, this is just the outline, so we'll come back to why these decisions are made this way. Um, kindergarten and first will be here Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Wednesday it will be a remote learning day. Um, what will be happening on Wednesdays is we'll be doing a deep cleaning within the building. You've seen this maybe in other plans for school districts, but also that will be the day that we um, we uh, feed. We send our we send um, food deliveries home for the week. Uh, we just have a shift of roles for our staff to to um, help out with that process. Um, and then for grades three through twelve, I have someone. Asking for annotation, I'm going to go ahead and approve that and see if something pops up while we're doing this. Um, in grades 3 through 12, we have, uh, we'll call it an AABB day. So Monday, Tuesday would be, we'll call those green days. And Thursday, Friday, will be orange days. So those are the days that um, those groups will be coming to school. So we've been really working hard at getting the um, the numbers balance between all our classes based on family groupings. Remember we talked about family was important. When we talk about our green and orange groups, they're grouped by families. So um, pretty common name in our area is Zare. So there's a lot of Zares. Um, not that all those Zares are from the same family, but they would be grouped, the, the, the Zare family would be grouped together. So. Um, I could use that because I'm using your name anyway. So you've got ages at different different um, grade levels. Um, we would not want them all to be in school on the same day because of the child care issue. Is what the main focus for that purpose was. Um, we talked about school lunch. Um, when students are not in school, they'll be off the opportunity to receive a supply of food for the week um, when they're not attending the course of their schedule. So, um, for instance, let's see we. Stop annotating here for a second. Let's see anything that popped up. Joe, are you seeing anything come up with questions or? Um, I have a couple in the live chat right now. Okay, is it related to what we're talking about right now? Um, I mean, we can. Yeah, do you want me to shoot them over to you? You should be able to see them in your chat as well on my next. Okay, so I will. And chat. we are actually successfully simulcasting on YouTube as well at this point. Okay. So. Okay, so I see a couple related to other school districts, so I'll come back to that. Um, one, a little bit more about that, and so, all right, so I will, um, I'll come back and address, address those questions as kind of part of the presentation, too. Um, so this would be a typical five-day in-school schedule, meaning that if it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, this is what it would look like. If you're in kindergarten, first grade, you would come either a.m. during the a.m. group or p.m. for the p.m. group. You come Monday, Tuesday, remote learning, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday would be, would be that case. In second grade, that's a full day. Those students will be here every day, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and in grades 3 through 12, you'll see that Monday, Tuesday, green group is here throughout the day, but the orange group is remote learning at home. Um, our cleaning day on Wednesday, and then Thursday and Friday, the orange group is here, and um, the green is remoting. Um, when students are not in school, they'll be participating in remote learning. So, um, so let me get into some of the reasoning of why we're where we're at at this point. Um, so the big, the hard decision was the pre-K decision. Um, it affects about maximum of 36 students. We have a program that's um, an AM, PM program, 18 students in the morning, 18 students in the afternoon. Um, while it's not a mandated program, we do believe that pre-K is an important program for sure, um, which may be one of the ways we cancel it. Well, that deals with some of the extra pieces um, that you see here. Um, and really the primary curriculum focus for our pre-K program is socialization. And with the guidelines that we have in front of us, um, we, uh, we 
it's very difficult to deliver that type of curriculum for pre-K. Um, uh, so um, that's that was one of the one of the reasons why. Um, next, uh, we do not receive grant funding. Um, through our conversations in our region, school districts were looking at canceling pre-K. Uh, a lot of school districts use pre-K to fund faculty. The, they use the grant that they get. Um, our funding for the program as well as the teaching staff um, is not funded through the grants. So we, um, we fund that through our general fund. So some concerns of some districts might be the case it is, well, we understand we might get the grant next year as well, so we're not going to lose the grant. That was the initial, one of the initial concerns. I still need to make sure I can keep these people because I need them to be able to do a job while they're here at school. So um, um, we fund that from a different way. Um, another one, if by pausing pre-K, and this is not a final, final decision at this point because we believe we could probably get pre-K started as the year goes on, depending on what happens with the regulations as well as financial situation. Um, there's a lot of questions about finances, so we were not looking to hire more people. We want to keep the staff that we have, um, but we don't, we're concerned about hiring somebody who could only be here for a short period of time if we cannot um, go for, uh, I just got one more chat box here. Um, so, what that did was that allows our K-2 students to attend four days a week. If you remember, our focus was to try to get our primary grades in school as much as possible. Um, another piece of this is looking at, um, well, actually, I'll move on to uh, K-1, because that should explain, that slide will talk about um, a little bit more. So, the kindergarten first grade program is about 130 students between the two grades. They're attending half day. Um, their focus is on phonics, reading, and writing. Um, yes, there's socialization, but it, they're, more, they're more focused on um, those LA standards and math standards. Um, social studies and science is incorporated in. Um, and then uh, we also have folks that um, have disabilities that that K and first grade group would need to, to, to attend with each other. Um, we won't be serving lunches to those students. They will be part of the food delivery so that they'll be able to get that. Um, that actually opens up the schedule to be able to um, uh, schedule our staff the way that we must. Okay, so let's talk about second grade because this is a, this is a key component when we connect second grade to pre-K. Um, so those two, they kind of ran together, but you're wondering why. Well, and why is second grade here every day? Well, with K and 1, when we look at their schedules, um, understanding what they do in the classes and how the lessons work in K and 1, it made sense to move to a half day based upon what they do each day in terms of the time. I understand the child care issue, but in terms of academic and education, um, uh, there's only a few things that would be pulled out from the half day that they could also get through remote learning on, on Wednesday. Um, but in second grade, the, uh, the academics move up a notch, I'd say. And so we looked at trying to get, actually we looked at all pre-K through two to be here full day, um, every day. Uh, but the numbers, we just could not make it work in terms of space and staff. Um, so we looked at second grade to say, you know what, if we can get them here full day, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, um, let's see if we can do that. So in order to do that, we have 61 students. That's our smallest class um, in the elementary. Um, that means that we can get uh, about 12 students in a class. The second grade clusters, while they're being remodeled, are smaller than um, our other classrooms. So uh, we can only fit actually 12 students in there. In order, but we only needed to add one section to get all our students here um, in a different classroom. So uh, what we're able to do is grab our pre-K program, look at that staff member, be able to get they would be able to teach uh, second grade to, to do that. Um, so those two ran in conjunction with each other. Um, we really try to get every, every kid in primary here every day, but in terms of our staffing and the needs of those students, which is another case in second grade, um, the percentage wise of the number of specialist students in second grade is higher and to be able to get the services that are required due to their IEP, um, we really need them here every day to make that work. 
Um, uh, Wednesday, students report remote learning. Um, lunch will be eaten in classrooms, um, and special areas will push into the classroom. So, so that delivered instruction will take place. Special areas would be uh, PE, music, art. All right, I just want to see if I've hit some of those questions that have already in there. I think those are some of the high ones. Um, yep, so here's the question, why the reopening plans in neighboring districts look so different from Beaver River? Some districts have multiple grade levels back almost every day. Does this have to do with floor plans and resources? Actually, I would say it probably deals more with resources when we're talking about people. Um, uh, we are, our size causes, so there's a couple things. If we look at and a neighboring district that's small, they've lost a lot of students over time, they have space in their building to bring students back and are able to move some kids around um, to make that work. And their numbers are so small that it's easy to do that way. Look at the larger school that's neighboring us, um, they have a lot of uh, academic support uh, staff, uh, and that's because of their size. That's not, that's just the way it works. Um, uh, they are able to reassign those staff. We have academic support staff, um, but not to the number to be able to split and get more students here as possible. Um, so that was a great question. I think that was Jackie Pate. Thank you, Jackie. Um, we have, uh, why are we doing half K days for K1? I think I've answered that. Um, how will that work between cleaning? Well, that would be the, um, because we're not doing lunch, that actually creates time to be able to do cleaning between those groups. So there will be cleaning that takes place um, during that it's about an hour and 45 minutes in the middle of the day that we were able to get to those rooms and hammer, hammer the cleaning on those. Um, um, why are we doing half days for K1? So we talked about that one. Kindergarten is also not mandated either. That's, that's true. Um, we're trying to get as many programs as we can. I'd love to get pre-K back in. And we may have a solution. So we're not close to the idea that we can't get pre-K in here. Right now, we can't come up with a way to do that. If people have ideas, we're open to those ideas and we'll investigate those for sure. Um, same question. Have guidelines come out regarding increasing the amount of time spent in school as we continue into the year and COVID rates? So that's a question about guidelines coming down the road um, in terms of time of school. Now, actually, um, really, one thing I haven't really mentioned is sometime this week, the governor, the governor is going to tell us what we're going to do with reopening school. I'm not exactly sure what that's going to look like because we've already been given now guidance for what the three models could look like. We were tasked to do a remote learning model, a hybrid model, and a, and a um, all in school model. Um, I'm hoping if, if Really, the big piece for us to be, get more kids into school is the social distancing distance piece. Six feet makes it very hard to get many students in here, more, over, more than half the students in here at a time, um, unless we really expand the building. If we move down, we did this measurement today, if we move down to four or three feet, we'd be able to get students in here. That's the point where you know we're hoping that as time goes on, that distance will shrink and we're able to get more students in here. That's what our hope is. That's a great question. Um, oh, someone says thank you and thank you for thanking us. Um, what stakeholder groups were represented on our reopening committee? So at this point, we did a task force committee that um, had uh, really, we, we focused on um, a teaching staff, administrators, um, we had a union representation, uh, we had support staff that came in, um, so we had multiple folks that were part of that. Um, this is the first step to make sure we have uh, additional parent input. Obviously, we have staff that are parents, so we got some pieces of that, and we used our surveys. Um, so we're looking for input from this as well, and we'll be looking at other ways. I want to talk to the board about possible ways to do that. Um, we've even talked uh, with having some high school students come in, and we're looking for some maybe feedback from students as well. Um, like I said, the, the, the plan that has been posted is a draft plan at this point. Things change on a daily basis, so we're trying to make sure we can adjust to those. Um, we really needed to get to the point where we were able to um, understand the regulations first before we really um, dug deeply into the next steps. 
Um, question about if enrollment drops due to homeschooling, will the number numbers be re looked at to see if we can lessen half day? Absolutely. If we if we have less students that are coming to our school, we'll plug the numbers in and see what we can do. Um, some of the areas that we're really focusing on where the needs are. Um, we have some high need special ed classrooms that will probably be here every day, um, like our 1211 classrooms, our 151 classrooms. Um, uh, and then we'll be looking at individual cases based upon um, IEP needs that we're able to deliver um, as well. So um, I'm just going to keep hitting these as we go. These questions these are great questions. It's covered. Was I able to enter? If there's any idea when the schedule may be finalized, so people that are needing child care can plan which days they may need it. Um, we are we are working on the final cohort. board. Um, I'm hoping um, really by the end of this week we'll get those letters out to let you know what cohort there is, so they'll know which one it'll be. Um, yeah, uh, pre-K idea two days a week. If we can make that work, we'd love to do it. So you know we've got we'll, we'll work on that as well. Um, are you planning on using the gyms and cafeterias for social distance if they are being used? There would be viable options. So actually, really, space probably isn't the biggest issue uh, for what we're doing. We've got some space that we're able to do. Actually, we're sitting in a room that potentially could be space, the band room. Um, we are looking at moving band classes, band rehearsals, whatever we end up doing, band ensembles, probably using the auditorium because they need more space than what they have now. In this room, so this would be a space. So actually, space isn't as big of an issue as it is really the staffing um, that we would need to be able to provide the education that's needed there. Uh, state guidelines require distance learning to be available for any families who are not comfortable sending their child to school in person. How would be we we're addressing this? So that would be handled through our remote learning. Uh, we're working on the specifics of what that would look like. Um, the guidelines discuss right now. They discuss that. If a student is um, has a compromised immune system and parents don't want them to come to school, um, we need to just know that and get the doctor's note and we would um, provide learning that way. We've got a couple options out there, but nothing has been solid on that. So, but we will need to provide the education for that. So, um, it could be a camera in the classroom. It could be um, a separate teacher that does that or a, a regional course uh, delivery that looks that way. So it really depends on each individual situation. Um, we're still waiting to see because I have a feeling that potentially um, we may need to require that for all families. But at this point, the only two options um, for students who are not able to come to school, one would be if they're not able to come to school because of medical conditions, we would deliver the, the instruction. If it's a family choice, and this is as it stands today, if it's a family choice that you do not want to send your ch child, um, homeschool instruction is the process for that, and there's a specific way that that is done. Um, and that would be handled um, actually through the middle school office. Uh, we have um, our homeschool coordinator through there. Once the plan is approved, will a survey be done to see how many are planning on keeping their kids enrolled? Absolutely. So we have a survey that's working, we're working on. Uh, one dealing with transportation, how um, who plans on driving students, who doesn't, so they can figure that piece out, but as well as who plans on keeping their students home based upon medical conditions, and that again, that's as it stands today. It could change. It could be that if a family decides not to, the governor kind of referred to that today. Um, then we'll need to we'll need to get that information to be able to determine the numbers and what that looks like. So great questions. And I'm only on second grade, but the next group is grade three through twelve. So this is a this is the larger group about the orange schedule and the green schedule. You saw that schedule what that looked like earlier. Um, we'll be assigning those and getting that information out. Um, special areas we'll be pushing in classrooms. Um, it's synchronous and asynchronous learning, um, and uh, what that means is basically they'll be learning at the same time, maybe while the teacher is there, but there may be also be learning that takes place, um, things posted that students may have to complete, um, which we are investigating technical issues. Um, you know, if, if we were to look at families, we looked at this number today, if we looked at families that were um, not just that did not have access, but students who had limited access based upon their bandwidth, 
um, you know, we're looking at 18 to 20% of our student population. That's a significant population. So trying to calculate what needs to be done for that is still in the process. We did a lot of packet delivery, but what we really need to do is get the actual names of those families that have that issue. We've honed in on a lot of them, but there are some that haven't responded yet, so we're making phone calls to those families to make sure we know what that connection looks like. Um, yeah, we talked about the special ed situation. Uh, block scheduling is a component that we've been doing at the high school. Uh, we're looking to do that at the middle school, and what that does is that actually limits the amount of movement for students, which is something that the guidelines um, specified that we needed to do. Basically, the limited movement is based upon you have less classes in one day. So your Monday green day looks different than your Tuesday green day. Um, and that's to um, have less movement. Okay, some other circumstances. Um, we talked about the students. Uh, we are looking at potentially like a room like this. If there are technical um, uh, connectivity problems. We obviously have a connection here. So while we can't have the numbers in the classroom, we may be able to have spaces in our building to use for students to come and connect uh, their devices um, here at school. Um, we're also looking at other locations throughout the district where there might be internet connections that folks could use. So we'd be communicating that out as well. Uh, but also if students are having trouble engaging, we may be able to provide support here at school as well, because uh, some, in some cases, in many cases, remote learning is not even close to the best situation. Um, we are looking at CTE, OCS uh, programs, uh, what that looks like. Um, they're still working on what that could look like. HG, uh, Te Sackis Technical Center in Glenfield, um, their student populations for a lot of those classes are small enough that they might be able to take students every day. Um, once we have that piece, we will be able to get that information out to those families, which I think maybe that might be a, oh, there's a really long statement that I'm going to probably pull up in just a minute. Um, we talked about Wednesday as a cleaning and feeding day. Uh, the deep cleaning as well as lunches will be delivering on a weekly basis. This last one, social emotional health, this is one of those pieces that up until the last few years school districts weren't really involved with, but we have really picked up um, what we've been doing for that and providing counseling, which I think is what one of these questions are relating to poverty. So um, here's the question. Poverty is a growing issue in our community, community and several that ride the line of struggling due to income guidelines, social programs, although the district is focused on helping with child care issues and cohorts. Could we create some sort of task force that includes school members and parents to put our heads together for solutions? Absolutely. And let me tell you just one idea that we've had out there at this point is, and I'd be happy to create a group to be able to figure out this child care, is um, when we had a meeting with the county a week ago, we talked about creating an online form for potential providers, certified providers, uncertified provide, certified providers. So basically creating a way to be help to create a conduit between families and child care providers families and babysitters, families that have students that are at home that could maybe have share some responsibility, some of the, whatever that could look like. So what we would do is we create an online form for people who could provide those services and that would put an online database for folks to have contact numbers to call to create child, to help with child care. One of the, one of the pieces of, of solutions that we're trying to put together. And um, absolutely there are limited certified providers Maybe there's something creative we can come up with as a community. So that was a good suggestion. And I think, um, so um, we'll work on actually how to do that. I just got one more question. Oh, great ideas. Yes, that's it. Okay. Um, so I want to tell you about what we're working on to support what's happening. Um, up until, well, two years ago, we started a one-to-one -one program in a couple of grades. Um, we now are able to have Chromebooks, so devices for every student, grades 3 through 12. Okay, in, 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 um, I get this mixed up because I feel like we've changed our plan a little bit, Joe, so I might need some help on this one. But uh, grades 5 and up are go home. Okay, grades 3 and 4 have carts in the classroom. Did I have that right? But there's still one for each student. One for each student still. And that's more of a management piece to make sure 
that works. If we go to remote learning, all remote learning, those are going home. Everybody's going to have them. Okay? Now, we still have the connectivity issue that the Chromebooks don't sell, but Chromebooks are able to download the, um, the documents for the day while you're here at school so they can work offline at home. So we're working on how to help train for that. Um, we've added internal email accounts, so every student that has a one-to-one -one Chromebook will have, will have an email account, which allows us to be able to communicate through Google Classroom much better. And then for grades 9 through 12, did I have that right? Okay, making sure. Um, 9 through 12 will have external accounts based upon the needs of those grade levels, meaning that they would be able to do email through to colleges in those types of situations. Um, we do need to do training about face masks, hand washing, hygiene to all people that enter the building. So we'll be working on even videos on what that would look like. Um, and we'll talk about the child care database a minute ago. So what's next? So as it stands right now, under the current guidelines, our model is that hybrid schedule. Okay, we can still tweak the schedule to see if something changes. Um, if things open up, we could move to a full in-person and if they open up even more and the infection or the uh, guidelines allow us to go back to what we used to do, we'll get to that point. I have hope we're going to get to that point. If um, whatever the guidelines are for moving to a complete remote learning, we are setting up our classrooms and our teachers and we're giving them instructions as time goes on. Obviously, we're working on the plan, so we're going to work on how to help our staff um, to easily transition from an in-school model hybrid model to a remote learning, if that has to happen. Um, here's a question. In the spring, there were some restrictions and students were able to view certain content put out from their teachers. Will that be resolved as Chromebooks go out? Um, it's a technical issue, I believe, more than anything, so we're working on that piece. There, they will stay, we still have to filter those, those Chromebooks, though. So um, that's a requirement from the federal government on uh, filtering requirements. Um, so um, our hope is to help our staff understand what's filtered and what's not to help um, work through that process. Okay, I think I caught up on the question. Oh, one more popped in. I think. Here we go. Will you do any sort of open house? It'd be a good opportunity to practice with masks and social distancing. Remember, our kids haven't been in big groups since March. You're absolutely right. That is a... Um, a big concern. Um, we have to think methodically about an open house or some type of method to show the process of what school will look like, especially at the, um, at the uh, primary grades. Um, outdoors may work, right? Outdoors may work. Yeah. BOCES reopening plans on the BOCES website and BOCES with some more information about what those classes will look like. Okay, great. So we will snag onto that and grab onto that and work with that with our CTE classes. Thank you, Mrs. Baker, our graphic arts teacher at BOCES. Um, what's coming up next? Uh, the, we need input from families regarding transportation. Yeah, I love the idea of grabbing a group around child care. That makes sense. So um, we can pull that together. Uh, obviously, to get everybody, depending on how many people are interested in that, we could um, uh, do that locally in a group like this, or we might have to do it virtually, or come up with another way to do it. Um, the governor uh, talked about schools today, but sometime this week he's going to give us the directive about what he called reopening of schools. Um, I think it's probably going to be around the um, metrics that need to be used of reopening schools. What's the infection rate? What's the infection rate of the region? What's the infection rate of the school? One thing he mentioned today that has not been in any of the guidance that we're not sure exactly how that has to be done. He mentioned today that schools will be responsible for testing. So we're not even sure what that means yet. That was a statement with no guidance yet. So testing, not like um, mass testing, um, COVID-19 testing. So how do, we, how do we handle that? And is there enough testing in the county to be able to do that in our schools? Um, we're also waiting to find the directive around the choice of home instruction versus not. So um, uh, we are working on what those pieces could look like. Um, and then we're just going to continue to communicate in lots of ways. If you're in the chat room and, and, or the chat on the WebEx, if you want to put in there the best way to communicate to you, go ahead and put it in. If it's texting, if it's the phone calls, we're actually moving to a new system that hopefully is much easier to use with more 
um, more ways to communicate. It's the website, it's Facebook, we send letters. I think the letter was the, the, the start of the best communication to open things up. If, you, if it's easier for us to post videos of what's happening, maybe that's the way to do it, um, and we'll use news media. So this is the last slide. 55 minutes of presenting, um, and you can see there's still a lot of work to be done um, with the opening. Um, I am open to having, um, you know, I think I've hit all the chat questions. If folks have more questions, they can put those in. Um, we'll give it a couple minutes. Uh, board members, do you have questions for us or even the principals around as well? We need to talk. That has come up through that process. When you say feeding day, there's still going to be school lunches for the upper grades on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday? Yes. So when students are here, we will have meals for the students that are here. If a student who's in third grade and is in, is in the um, dream group, that means they're not going to be in school on Thursday, Friday, and they sign up for the lunch program, the delivery lunch program, they will get a meal for Wednesday, because they were here Monday, Tuesday. They'll get a meal for Wednesday, they'll get a meal for Thursday, they get a meal for Friday. And they'll come to school on Monday and they'll get a meal here. So really trying to work out what that looks like is, is a little more complicated than it, than it was before. Um, because now we've got meals happening here and meals going home. But by having Wednesday as a, as a day to organize that piece of it, that's what will hopefully make it a little bit better. Okay, I've got a couple more questions that have popped up. Actually, they're popping up like hotcakes now. Okay, so we understand the second grade will benefit from being in class all day with the help of the pre-K teacher. However, we do not believe that taking away pre-K will be an even trade. Okay, I, I will say that's a fair statement. Um, I think when we looked at, uh, at where the needs were, it made the most sense for our school district. How will students with IEPs be serviced with remote learning? Um, so when we look at students that we would have here more often than a, a blue or a green and orange schedule, um, the priority we look at, or one of those is the IEP students. So even as resource room, can we find a way to have those students here every day to get those services? Um, in addition, we're looking to do, if those students aren't here, we need to enhance what we're doing to our, for our IEP. And that, that's a family to, um, that's a family to special ed teacher, family to the CSC department conversation, so that we can get those resources in place that need to happen. Um, an IEP is an individual education program, so individual needs need to be addressed, which means the way we meet those needs also need to be addressed individually. Sorry, if you've already, oops, I think I skipped it. For grades K-1, will we be able to request AM, PM? If so, when so? We can plan for child care. The difficulty with the AM, PM discussion and the green and orange cohort uh, really is around the impact that every decision makes based upon the family and those numbers of those family members in the other grade levels. So trying to, because we are very close with our numbers, the 12 in a classroom um, or the 14 in the classroom, depending on the grade level, we're right there within the size of our classes. So we had to get as close as possible to that. Um, so we're actually not able to take requests at this point. I, I love to be accommodated as much as possible, but to make this work and make this work on time, we're going to need to, need to um, piece, those, uh, piece those many variables together all at once. Um, and we'd like to get these out this week for planning for child care. Uh, will the after school program still be offered? That's a great one. We haven't had a, a full conversation, much of a conversation with the after school program. I have a hard time seeing how that's going to work. 
But I want to have a conversation with um, Courtney and the group at uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension to see if we can keep that going. Uh, that's a child care issue. Totally understand that. It's also an academic issue. Um, and socialization issue. So we'll have to work on that um, to make sure it works for our, um, if we can do after school. Uh, there are fewer teachers who are also parents of young kids. Many will scramble for daycare. How remote will learning look? Like it did this spring, or can it be real time? How will those teachers ensure their own kids are still working and learning? Remote real time learning would be wonderful. Um, we're hoping that we can solve those problems. Um, every, you know, I, I can't say that we've got every answer. I really can't. Um, uh, we've had discussions with our staff on how to solve that. Um, it's not a good, it's not a great solution. It would be the same problem with a, um, say somebody who works at the hospital and has both parents work at the hospital, how do we make help those students um, at home as well? So um, it is a that's, a, that's a good discussion for our, I believe we're gonna have a child care work group to really hammer out what that looks like. Um, and some of that, you know, the suggestion here would, um, remote real-time learning would be wonderful. Yeah. I'm, that means that we would have a camera in the classroom, in every classroom, delivering it so that that first the teacher can also talk to the students. Um, you know, that's we have to work through the technical side of that. Um, that's not an easy one, not an easy solution for the size of our school district. Great questions. Great was, questions. There was one above regarding cohorts in second grade. Was there? Okay. Yes. And this one. Find it. Let me, let me just read just it. Just read it to me. Yeah. All right. How will the second grade cohort be split since they've already been designated a teacher? So we worked on that. Um, uh, the principal and the teachers have been kind of figuring out what that would look like. Um, and then we will give a letter out to that delivery. It's really the same way we would do it normally. We look at students, their needs, what can be doing in the classroom, the space in the classroom, and the balance within the classroom if there are. Um, special needs that are needed, so we want to balance out what that looks like. So um, we just have to go back to the drawing board. Now we have five sections of second grade versus four. Okay, I'm a little parched, but we'll keep going. Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. Is there any indication how close to the local level an ultimate decision can be made regarding the next? Whether we move into the next phase of, of, of bringing more students in, but like, or, or is it, you know, because we're New York State and it, it, we got a really big deal down the city, it's going to affect, the, or is it going to be left to regions or counties or? So I think the, the only indication about any sort of local decision would have been around the region discussion that the governor said on July 13th about the percentage of students infection rate by region, which ends up just a metric measure, right? right. So it's not really a decision, it's what's happening. Um, because of the guidelines that have come our way, and their Department of Health and State guidelines, um, there's very little local control. And until that gets released, which I don't I, I haven't seen any indication that that's going to happen, um, by region. It would make sense in our region to have that happen because of our infection rate. Um, but to, to decrease the number of, um, what we need is this space. We need a six foot. Right, yeah. but, but, but decreasing, I, I guess what I'm saying. By region? Is, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, county. Yeah. I, by I, school and, districts in the county. Yeah, I, I think county it would be great. Right. Yeah, but I think if Ashley's still on, I think, you know, she's, she's got the same issue. She's got that. Guys is coming her way. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't see any any county by county decisions being allowed um, in regard to easing restrictions about social distancing or mask wearing. Um, really, until we see um, either a vaccine or dramatic decreases in infection rates nationally. That 
Makes sense. That's what we've been seeing. Sure. So this, this discussion is not over. I want to make sure people understand that this is a draft plan trying to coordinate what, what works best for our school district. And that's why school districts are different across the board. You know, we all have different staffing situations. We all have different contract situations. We all have different um, communities. Um, and, uh, and so that's why they, they do look different. We've had conversations to try to get as close as possible, but in some cases, um, Certain decisions don't make sense for school districts. So, um, just let's see. We got got any little comments here? Yeah, yep. So North Country Reason has had low rates throughout all of this. Yeah, yeah, we've seen that, and um, we'd like to keep it that way for sure. Absolutely. So, any other questions from the board or out in the virtual world? I do apologize for the YouTube connection. We will post this video though, so um, you can share that with other folks. It looks like a lot of folks were able to join um, at some point. We didn't get started until about 20 after 20 after five. So if you didn't get in much later than that, you didn't miss a whole lot. So. Okay, I think I'm gonna hold up on this presentation. Ashley, thank you for taking the time and joining us. I know we're a little, little longer than we thought it would, but. Um, it's a complicated world we're in, for sure. So. Yes. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. We'll, we'll be in touch, I'm sure. Yeah. Have a good night. You too.